right, y'all, we are in the final days of 2022, and you know what that means. It is time for the year in review, the great yearly reading wrap-up, in which I list both the worst and the best books that I read this year. Now, most booktubers would probably just list the best books, but not me, because I don't just heap praise, I also heap shit. And there were some books I read this year that more than deserved some shit slung their way. Now, unlike last year where I had an even 10 worst and 10 best books, this year, fortunately, I read more good books than bad ones, so I only have four books that I consider to be the worst that I read this year, although I still have 10 that I consider the best. So, we're going to get the worst out of the way first, and then we're going to move into the best and also, I'm going to try to keep this as short and concise as possible because I've done reviews for almost all of these. I think there's only one on here that I actually have not reviewed yet. But for the vast majority of these, if you would like to hear my full thoughts on them, you can just check back in my back catalog and see the reviews I did for them. So, without further ado, let's get on to the four worst books that I read this year, and then the 10 best. And kicking off with number four worst, as much as it hurts me to put this here, I had to. Suchery by Cormac McCarthy. I, I love McCarthy. Y'all know that I love McCarthy, but damn, this book was a pile of crap. Uh, the writing was beautiful and breathtaking, but that is about it. The characters were shallow, depthless. There was no philosophical undercurrent to the work like there is with the best of McCarthy's books, and the plot, such as it was, was repetitive as hell, inane, and criminally boring. This book was a complete dud, and again, though it breaks my heart to put Cormac McCarthy on the worst list, uh, my integrity mandated that I do, and so yeah, Suchery by Cormac McCarthy, number four, worst. Number three, worst. Hannibal by Thomas Harris. Every bad decision that a writer can make when writing a book was made in this book. The writing was inconsistent and switched between past and present tense for no apparent reason. The story was so gratuitous and exploitative it had me rolling my eyes. The characters did not match up that well to what they had been established to be in previous books, and the ending was so astoundingly bad that I actually felt insulted reading it. Thomas Harris really did just drop the ball with this sequel to his phenomenally successful The Silence of the Lambs, and oh my goodness, this book is very, very bad. Uh, scarcely any redeeming qualities, and if you are a fan of the Hannibal Lecter series, just stop with The Silence of the Lambs because it's a downhill plummet after that. Number two worst, Nightwood by Juna Barnes. Two words, word salad. That is all that this book is. It is just a bunch of words strung together with no semblance of coherence or genuine meaning. Imagine a novel-length text comprised of Kamala Harris speeches and Deftones lyrics, and you will get this book. T.S. Eliot's introduction to this book, which says absolutely nothing about it other than that there really isn't anything to get, says that this book is for those with a mind for poetry. Maybe I don't have a mind for poetry, but I can tell you that A, half of these words don't really make any sense the way that they were put together, and B, the characters in this book are flat as the paper that they exist upon, and C, this book is considered a queer classic, a classic of LGBT fiction, and I don't really think it is, because while there is that element to it, it gets buried under the copious amounts of gibberish and gobbledygook that is this book, and damn, this book was a waste of time. Terrible book. Don't read it. Nightwood, number two, worst. And the number one worst book that I read in 2022 was, and Brandon, if you're watching this, don't hate me, please. No offense intended, because I know you said this was one of your favorite books. But it was Thus Spoke Zarathustra, or my edition, Thus Spake Zarathustra. This book did not actually get a lower 
rating than any of the other books that I've just listed. Actually, it was higher than any of the other books, but the reason why I put this book as the number one worst is because this book is genuinely dangerous in a very real and literal sense. Um, you probably know who Friedrich Nietzsche was. Um, I read this book because it's considered, I think it may be the most famous philosophical novel ever penned, and um, I wanted to experience what Nietzsche's philosophy was really about firsthand instead of getting it like secondhand through other sources. And wow, was I horrified at just how bad some of the advice in this book is. This is basically an, an atheistic version of the Bible in which we have a, a wandering prophet figure spewing philosophy at the unenlightened peasants. And man, is that philosophy, like I said, really dangerous. Now, I read this, as I said, because I wanted to get a, a firsthand account of Nietzsche's philosophy, but also because I knew that Nietzsche was a very staunch individualist philosopher. And as am I, I consider myself a very firm individualist. And so I wanted to see what this book was about. But this is not the kind of individualism that I like to support. This is amoral um, very dangerous, as I've said, and it's basically a license to do whatever you want and to just trample on the rights of others as long as you think you are superior to them. Uh, because by this book's logic, it is a very circular logic, the only thing you have to do to be superior to everybody else is think that you are. And uh, this book made some claims also that were so laughably bad that I could not believe that anybody would actually say that. There is a point in this book where Zarathustra says, the world has been better more through war than it has through charity. No, it hasn't. I, I don't know anybody who would actually believe that. Also, this was one of the most brutally misogynistic things I have ever read. And also, Nietzsche never, subject, never subjects his own philosophy to any kind of challenge or critique. The characters that Zarathustra comes across in this book, never challenge him on any of the points he makes. He walks into a town, says, y'all are some dumbass pieces of shit, and I'm smarter than you, and I'm better than you, and then it ends with all the people of the town saying, you're right, Zarathustra, you're so much better than us. This is, I, to reiterate again, one of the most genuinely dangerous books that I have ever read. There are I can only imagine a crap ton of impressionable college kids that will read this book and think that they are the ubermensch and subsequently become total tools. Don't let yourself be one of those people. There is a lot of valuable stuff to be had in this book. I said that profusely in the review that I did of it. But you need to read this book skeptically and with great discretion because some of this stuff is just downright poisonous. So. Number one worst book of 2022 due to the fact that it can condone and kind of make possible a great many atrocities and arguably has, Thus Spoke or Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. So now that we have the worst out of the way, let's kick off the best with number 10, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti, a nonfiction work actually. Um, so I picked this book up actually to use as something of a reference book for a book of my own that I worked on throughout the entirety of 2022, and this book utterly floored me. It truly altered my perceptions of what nonfiction can be because prior to the reading of this, I did not hold nonfiction in any high artistic regard. Like, I have a copy up here of John Krakauer's Into the Wild, and I tried reading that, and I just found it so dry and so dull and so artlessly written that it was kind of discouraging. But this book was not like that in the slightest. Thomas Ligotti is a fantastic writer, a very literary writer, and it really does show through here. Now, as to the content of this book, you're either going to take it or leave it. I personally took it because I aligned with a great many uh, of the things that it puts forth. Uh, but a lot of people won't, and so I can see it being kind of controversial or offensive to a lot of people's sensibilities. It's very, very bleak with a very dark, dim outlook on uh, human existence. But I think it's very valuable. It was very well done, 
and I loved it. It's probably the best nonfiction book that I've ever read by a country mile, and so for that reason, it made the list at number 10. And coming in at number 9 best, not a work of prose at all, but actually a comic, and that is Batman the Imposter. If you know me, you know I am a huge Batman fan. He was my hero when I was nine, and damn it, he's still my hero today. And so I always like to try to read a, co a comic or two on occasion, uh, although I don't really like to keep up with DC's main comics line because I have no interest in serialized storytelling. So I usually hit up their Black Label catalog, which is the, the uh, imprint under which all, all their adult-oriented content is published, and this was definitely adult-oriented, but this may just be their finest black label offering yet. Uh, this was uh, possibly the grittiest and realest Batman story that has ever been told. You know, ever since, like, 2005, that what Christopher Nolan did with Batman Begins, there's been that trend where people want to set Batman's mythos in a more grounded, less fantastical reality, but it has never been taken so far and probably will never be taken farther than in this comic right here. This is as real as it gets for Batman. I do not think it can be surpassed in terms of plausibility. This was gritty, adult-oriented storytelling with some fantastic artwork as well. And uh, if you have never read a Batman comic and you just want to pick something up, just a one-off, give this a go because it is a perfectly self-contained story. It also provides you with a kind of a, a background telling of Batman's origin, the all, the all too famous origin now. And uh, yeah, this was utterly fantastic. This surpassed the Batman movie that we got um, this year with Robert Pattinson. And that was a pretty good movie. But uh, this blew that out of the water. It is one of the best comics I have read in quite some time. And for that reason, it made it in at number nine best. And at the number eight spot on the best list, we have Cities of the Plain by Cormac McCarthy. McCarthy both made, made the worst and the best list. Uh, this was the final volume of the Border Trilogy, and I personally really liked it. I think it concluded things nicely. I understand why this is the most neglected and forgotten of uh, that trilogy, because it kind of feels like it uh, covers a lot of the same ground as the first book did, but I think it does it a lot better, and it's a whole lot more poignant and impactful than the first book, and this was one of the most emotional and moving things that McCarthy has ever read. There's uh, actually a very well done romance aspect to this, and the ep the ep not, yeah the epilogue of this story, I think, um, which occurs many many years after the main events of the story, is one of the most metaphysically dense things that I have ever encountered. It is so mystical and inscrutable. I don't have a damn clue what it meant, but I loved it, and it actually wrapped up on kind of a happy ending for a McCarthy book, which is kind of a rarity, so I really liked it. Is it McCarthy's best book? No, not even really close, but uh, it is a very strong, in my opinion, conclusion to the Border Trilogy, and I thought it capped things nicely, so yeah, this was, I think, the first book that I read this year may have been. I don't know. I'd have to look, but it was it was early January when I read this, so it just barely made it in, but I'm glad it did because I really liked it quite a bit. Number seven, we have the quintessential war novel and the quintessential anti-war novel, All Quiet on the Western Front. I read this because of the Netflix film that was uh, coming out this year, and this book was a stunning experience. It is visceral, it is horrifying, in it, but it is deeply moving. And it really will make you look at war as it wants you to look at war, as the brutal and just utterly atrocious thing that it is. And it does it very artfully. It's a very well-written book, and the way it concluded surprised me because it concluded in a way that I did not think it could by the logic of the way it's written, but it hits all the harder because of it. 
And the movie was also really good as well. But this book is, for good reason, the definitive war novel. And I don't know that that will ever be changed. I think this book said some very important things, and it said them exactly when they needed saying. And for that reason, it made it in at number seven on the best list. At number six, we have Stoner by John Williams. Now, I actually read two John Williams books this year, Stoner and Butcher's Crossing. And I actually said in my review of Butcher's Crossing that I kind of liked it a little bit more than Stoner, I think, because... Not only was it definitely more exciting, but it really dealt with some bigger themes because Stoner doesn't really deal with much. But in the interests of impartiality, I think Stoner is pretty clearly the better book, and so I included it here because I also really loved Stoner. It's a great book. I would describe this book as kind of the literary equivalent of Seinfeld. You know, Seinfeld is called The Show About Nothing, Stoner is kind of the book about nothing. It's just this quaint little unassuming book about one guy's life, which is neither particularly exciting nor successful. And it was just kind of a really miniature epic, kind of. It was just, it, it's not something that's going to thrill you, but it's just quietly powerful. And I loved it. This is one of those few books that everybody says you have to read that really lives up to the hype. You know, I, I went into Stoner hearing so many good things about it, and I was like, can it really be that good? And you know what? It really was. The writing in this was utterly impeccable. I, this was A-plus level writing. And yeah, Stoner, I mean, it may not be the most revolutionary thing ever written, but it is a ringing success on basically all its fronts. So yeah, it's number six. And at number five, we have the one on this list that... I don't have a review on. Well, I mean, I have it, but I haven't uploaded it because I'm going to be planning to do that sometime next year to coincide with some other content I will be hopefully putting out um, uh, pertaining to the, the author of this work. And that is Timon of Athens by William Shakespeare. So I had put a, a post on Instagram, actually, in which I showed off my rather meager collection of Shakespeare's plays, and somebody said, I think it might have been Stella, I think it might have been her, it, it's too late to apologize, she said, oh, you might like to read Time of Athens, it's a real, it's a rather obscure Shakespeare work, it may be his least popular work, and that gave me the impetus to do so, because I had been familiar with Time of Athens for some time, and I really wanted to read it, and so that finally gave me the last kick. I was like, I'm going to read Time of Athens because it's kind of that black sheep of the Shakespeare body of work. And oh my goodness, I'm so glad that I did because this is now probably my favorite Shakespeare work. I think it actually upset Hamlet. Now, it's not to say that it's better than Hamlet. I don't know. No, it's not better than Hamlet. It's not even a perfect play, but it hits really, really hard in the subject matter that it deals with and the conclusions that it reaches about human nature are invaluable. And they are sadly just as true and relevant today as it was when this was written. It's very bleak. It may be Shakespeare's bleakest work, but it's also immensely powerful and it hit me harder, I guess, than any of his other works. So yeah, this is probably my Favorite Shakespeare play now, but coming in at number five, Time of Athens. And at number four, we have Warlock by Oakley Hall, one of the greatest Western novels ever written, and possibly the Western novel that served to elevate the genre from the gutter of the pulps in, in, into the realm of genuine literature. This is a fictionalized retelling of Wyatt Earp's showdown at the OK Corral, and through the lens of that, Oakley Hall is able to extract some pretty dismal pronouncements about us as humans and our capacity for idolization of people that don't really deserve it, and also the fragility and often the paradoxical nature of law. There is a lot going on in this book. It's a pretty lengthy book, but oh boy, is it well worth the read. Uh, this was just, uh, just a resounding success of a book. It succeeds, I think, on basically everything it wanted to 
do and be. The characters are actually pretty well done. The writing is beautiful, and the themes of the story ring just as true now as ever. And yeah, uh, Warlock by Oakley Hall, no, no question, number four. Number three, The Deloriad by Missouri Williams, a very recent read, uh, both for me and because it was actually published this year. Uh, and this is probably the best debut novel that I've ever read, or at least in quite some time. Uh, this is the story of an incestuous family who seem to be the last surviving members of the human race after some undisclosed apocalyptic event trying to repopulate the earth. There is virtually no plot to this, but what you do get is some of the most beautiful writing you are reliable to encounter. Uh, it's kind, it, it has some themes to it, I think, although I've seen some other people dispute that. I, I think it really did have something to say. Um, it's very kind of grotesque, but it's also pretty, uh, powerful in its way. Again, it's kind of plotless and it just meanders, but I thought the characters were well done. Again, the writing is untouchable, and uh, the themes of it, such as they may or may not be, do kind of provide some stuff to chew on, or at least they did for me, and this book just took my breath away, and I'm so happy that I read it, and it made it in at number three. The number two best work that I read this year is Death Wish by Brian Garfield, the basis for the dubiously classic Charles Bronson 1970s grindhouse revenge thriller. Uh, this book was a lot different than what I thought it was going to be. I thought it would just be like, you know, the carnage that is the Charles Bronson film, but it is not. It is a lot more thoughtful, a lot more nuanced, and a lot quieter as well. The character in this book, the principal character of Paul Benjamin, who is a CPA who um, is pushed beyond his breaking point after his family is destroyed by a random and senseless act of violence and who subsequently descends into vigilantism. It's actually a pretty sobering tale and one that's really powerful, actually. And this, it says on the cover of this book that it's a thriller, but I think that's actually a misnomer. It's much more akin to literary fiction. It's it's not very fast-paced at all, and it's a pretty short book as well. It's much more of a character study about a man who feels that he has been failed by society as well as the beliefs and suppositions that he previously held and who, as a result, turns into something that he never thought he would have. And it's honestly kind of sad and depressing, but it does have a bit of grit to it, and it is exciting uh, especially there towards the end, but it's always engrossing, and I absolutely love this book. I think it surpasses the movie in every respect, and I would actually highly urge anyone out there to read this book that has seen the film just to see uh, how much smarter and how much better the book actually is. So yeah, number two was Death Wish, killer book, pun intended. And the number one best work that I read in 2022 was John Ford's controversial classic of English theater, Tis Pity, She's a Whore. This thing was a powerhouse work. It was dark. It was sinister. It was kind of disturbing and kind of revolting in some ways. But wow, did it have an effect. And this is now, I do believe, my favorite work of drama. That is a, That should be a real testament to this work's power. Uh, I, I, I think the greatest way you can open a story is by having a guy telling a priest that he just really wants to bang his sister. And then he ends up, he, they, he does get down with his sister. And the real, the real, art of this work is that you really want them to be together like you do. You want Giovanni and Annabella to be together, even though they are brother and sister, and the carnage that ensues at the end of this play was kind of staggering, but it all paid off so well. Again, this is one of the most sinister things that I think I've ever read. Uh, there is so much backstabbing and double-crossing. Again, it's so violent by the end. 
Um, and again, the incest thing might put some people off, but if it doesn't put you off, pick this up, give it a read, because it is an immensely, immensely effective work. And it is, like I said, I think now my favorite work of drama. It is that good. I gave this an A+, plus and I would give it an A+, plus again, in a heartbeat. The characters really came alive. It's very... It's very, it's very easy to imagine this, which is kind of not always the case when you're reading a play, but I could picture this scene by scene in my head reading this. The characters were so distinct, and they're not always um, defensible, but they're always understandable, and it all just culminates so well. I just love this play, and yeah, it was no question. That was number one. So yeah, that was my worst and best reads of 2022. Let me know down in the comments what you thought, whether you have read any of these, whether you have agreed or disagreed with anything I've said about them. If you haven't read any of these, well, if they're on the good list, I could recommend it. If they're on the bad list, stay away. And as always, if you have enjoyed anything you've seen or heard here today, remember to hit that like button and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. And, um, Let's see if 2023 can't bring some uh, reads to even surpass these. So yeah, uh, until next time, peace.